Good morning, I am Josephina Buckley. We welcome you to our January 2021 Youth Sunday at Mount Zion Baptist Church in Seattle, Washington. Thank you for joining us today. As the song says, one more time. Yes, we definitely thank God one more time. This month, we are celebrating Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. Our youth will present reflections later in our service. We, th we do thank God for his legacy. You are encouraged to explore and view our website for exciting news and resources. Remember to invite someone to Sunday school and church services every Sunday. Our awesome ministries are dedicated to serving and lifting up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Again, that's Romans chapter 12, verse 12. It states, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Thank you. And enjoy the service with us and do enjoy your blessings. Remember, someone is waiting for your smile. Good morning, Mount Zion. Please stand for the call to worship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. God is known in her palaces for a refuge. According to thy name, O God, so was thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Walk about Zion, go round about her. For this God is our God, forever and ever. He will be our guide, even unto death. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for 2021. Thank you for letting me have a family and everyone else who has a family. We pray for people who have coronavirus that they'll get better. We pray that coronavirus that it'll go away. And we also thank you for letting people have jobs and for the people who lost their jobs that they'll get new jobs. Thank you for letting me letting me go to school and everyone else go to going to school. We pray for them that they'll do good. And we pray for us that coronavirus will go away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My name is Jesse Alba. Thank you for joining us and have a happy new year.
please pray with me. Loving God, our Creator, we come to you in this moment in the most humble way we know, with heads bowed and our hearts open to you. We come thanking you, O oh God, for another day of life. You woke us up this morning and started us on our way, and we are glad. You put food on our tables and clothes on our back and joy, unspeakable joy, in our hearts. Holy One, we thank you for the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whom we celebrate today. In him, we have an example of what it looks like to give one's life to the cause of justice and equality. Lord, we know it's not enough just to honor him in word. We pray for strength and courage to honor him in deed. For we believe as he taught us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. And whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Yes, we are our siblings keeper. God, we think about the unrest in our nation's capital last week and our hearts are still tender. We saw unbridled hatred and unspeakable violence tolerated in ways we never expected to see. We pray that justice will prevail and that your way of peace will take hold and turn hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. God, we pray for the safety of all those participating in the inauguration this week. Bless the new president, the vice president, and their administration. May they work for all the people of this country instead of just their wealthy friends. Healing God, we pray for all those that are sick. You are the great physician, and we believe that if you would just go into every sick room and every hospital room and touch your people, that we shall be made whole. God, be with all those laboring with the COVID virus. Be with those undergoing treatments for cancer and those living with other chronic diseases and those that are struggling with addictions. Merciful one, over 390,000 families are mourning. 390,000 families are mourning the loss of loved ones since this deadly virus surfaced a year ago. Help them realize that earth has no sorrow, that heaven cannot heal. Wipe tears from their eyes in the midnight hour and give them peace that surpasses all understanding. God be with Mount Zion and strengthen us to serve your people. Help us get out of our own way so that we can see you high and lifted up. Be with our search committee as they select the next senior pastor for Mount Zion. God, when we have completed all that you have assigned to our hands and our feet and our hearts, we pray that we will be somewhere listening for our name. And when we cross that chilly Jordan into eternity, that we will enter that heavenly place singing, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. This is your servant's prayer. And we pray in the most precious name we know, the name of Jesus. And let all God's people say, Amen. Good morning. I'm Mount Zion trustee Brenda Charles Edwards. Even though the church is closed, our operating expenses continue, and in these difficult times, we need to support our charity ministry. Therefore, the trustees encourage you to use one of these four ways to give. First, Mail your tithes, offerings, and donations to the church while we observe COVID-19 mandates. Please include your membership number on your giving envelope and send checks or money orders payable to Mount Zion Baptist Church. In the memo line, please designate if it is for charity. 
The address is 1634 19th Avenue, Seattle, Washington, 98122. Second, use your cell phone to text MZBC and enter 73256. Third, you may bring your envelopes to the church security desk on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 12 noon to 2 p.m. And lastly, you can give online at www.mountzion.net, click Give, and follow the instructions. Thank you for your support, and God bless you. Good morning, Mount Zion. My name is Samira Shirazi. And my name is Samaya Shirazi. And, and we're, we're the Shirazi, Shirazi sisters. sisters. Today we are going to be doing an MLK reflection. Excerpt from the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was named after his father, Reverend Michael King, who was a senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. After touring much of Germany, the country that is the birthplace of Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, Reverend King Sr. returned to Atlanta and changed his and his son's name from Martin, from Michael to Martin Luther after the German Protestant leader. Now, what is your life's blueprint? Many of us have gone or will go through a time in our life where we have to consider and answer three very important questions. What will my life become? What do I have to offer to the world? And how does my God-given gift bring peace and justice to the world? Your life's blueprint should be a deep belief in your own dignity, your worth, and your somebodiness. Don't allow anybody to make you feel that you're nobody. Always feel that you count. Always feel that you have worth. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you will win or fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Thank you. Thank you. you.
Good morning, church. Today we are going to be reading John 4, verses 1 through 10. Jesus talks with a Samaritan woman. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judah and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus asked her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Again, this was John 4, verses 1 through 10. Good morning. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Reverend Paul Edwards, one of the associate ministers here at Mount Zion. Welcome. On this first Youth Sunday of our new year, I wanted to thank all of our youth and their parents for their preparations and for making this a very special, special service. This past Friday, January 15th, was the birthday of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Tomorrow is a national holiday honoring his birth, life, and dream. Martin Luther King, Jr. Day is the only national holiday designated as a national day of service to encourage all Americans to volunteer to improve their communities. It's a time to remember the injustices that Dr. King fought. It's a time to remember his fight for the freedom, equality, and dignity of all races and people through nonviolence. It's a time to remember Dr. King's dream of love and equality for all people. I had the unforgettable honor of marching with Dr. King in March of 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee during the sanitation worker strike. Just a month later, Dr. King was assassinated in that same city. In the midst of our country's racial reckoning, as we confront the issues of social justice, prejudice, and class oppression, I couldn't help but wonder, what would Dr. King think about this current cultural and political moment we're in as a nation? Well, I wouldn't dare try to begin to answer that question. But I'm reminded of one of Dr. King's most prophetic statements about America. He said, when our days become dreary with the low hovering clouds of despair, let us remember that there is a creative force in this universe, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Let us realize the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Dr. King realized that social justice, prejudice, and class oppression went against the teachings of the Bible. And we find a biblical example of these same cultural and political moments in today's scripture passage in John 4. It's a biblical example of how Jesus confronted and proactively dealt with the social just injustice, prejudice, and class oppression in his day. Please open your Bibles to John 4, verses 1 through 10, to see how Jesus responded to the cultural differences of his day. To provide some cultural background and context, 
Note that within the first nine verses of our passage, there are three separate subgroups of the Jewish culture that are mentioned. In verse 1, the Pharisees. In verse 2, Jesus and his disciples. And in verse 9, the Samaritans. Please note further that there is cultural tension among these three separate subgroups of the same culture. Listen for the parallels in cultural differences in Jesus' day that are quite similar to the differences we are struggling with today. The Pharisees claimed that the religious authority in Jesus' day, thus they claimed the authority to regulate the rites and ceremonies of religion, and hence they supposed they had a right to inquire about the conduct of both John the Baptist and Jesus. And in verse 1 of our passage, we see that the Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. The fact that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist displeased the Pharisees because this weakened their authority and influence. The Pharisees were already displeased with John the Baptist, and now Jesus is doing the same thing, but on a larger scale, not only making disciples, but baptizing as well without their authority, and thereby drawing more people away from the Pharisees. Thus, the cultural tension between the Pharisees and Jesus and his disciples. The other source of cultural tension found in verse 9 of our passage was between the Jews and the Samaritans. Note in verse 9, John writes, The Samaritan woman said to him, meaning Jesus, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. There was bitter hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a mixed race, part Jew and part Gentile, which grew out of the Assyrian captivity of the 10 northern tribes in 727 BC. After capturing the 10 northern tribes of Israel, the king of Assyria deported large numbers of the captured Israelites and scattered them all throughout the empire. The Assyrian king then took other captured people from throughout the Assyrian empire and transplanted them into Samaria to repopulate this land. Well, the results were only natural. Intermarriage took place and the people became a mixed breed which influenced the strict Jews who held to a pure race. The Samaritans were thus rejected by the Jews because they could not prove their genealogy. Therefore, the Samaritans established their own temple and religious services on Mount Gerizim. Samaritans and Jews worshiped the same God and both used the law of Moses, although the Samaritans made a few changes in it but they despised one another's places of worship and had remained hostile toward each other for centuries. This only flamed the fires of prejudice even more. So intense was the Jews' dislike of the Samaritans that some of the Pharisees prayed that no Samaritan would be raised in the resurrection. When Jesus' enemies wanted to call Jesus an insulting name, they called him a Samaritan. Wow! The social justice, prejudice, and class oppression in Jesus' day is not uncommon from the cultural tensions Dr. King witnessed in his day and the cultural tensions we see and experience today. Interesting how the more things change, the more they stay the same. So with that cultural backdrop, backdrop Let's see how Jesus dealt with the social injustice, prejudice, and class oppression of his day to sharpen our Christian response to cultural differences. And I want to acknowledge the writings of Dr. Tony Evans on this important issue. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Almighty God, we pray this morning for an open mind and a willing spirit so that we might learn your truth and share it with others. In your son's name we pray, amen. Well, how does Jesus deal with this mounting tension from the Pharisees? Jesus sensed the danger the Pharisees presented for him, and knowing that his time had not come, 
He left Judea out of necessity. But note two very important things about this flight of necessity. First, Jesus left Judea for John's sake. The crowds were leaving John and coming to Jesus, and the Pharisees were using this fact to downgrade John's ministry. Jesus did not want to create a competitive scene and damage John's ministry, so Jesus left the area and returned to Galilee. Second, Jesus left Judea to confront a Samaritan woman. Jesus' encounter with a Samaritan woman is one of the clearest explanations of the importance as well as the methodology of reaching out beyond one's own culture. Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman gives us a clear picture of his response to cultural differences and Jesus' response should shape our response as well. As we examine Jesus' encounter with the Samaritan woman, we will see how Jesus responded to cultural differences within the context of spiritual need, common ground, cultural shock, biblical truth, Christian identity, and cross-cultural ministry. Let's begin with a geography lesson. In verse 3 of this morning's scripture, we learn that Jesus and his disciples left Judea, which was in the southern region of Palestine, and went back to Galilee, which was in the northern region. Samaria was a region where the Samaritans lived, was in the middle of the journey from Judea to Galilee. However, due to the cultural tensions between the Jews and Samaritans mentioned earlier, no pure-blooded Jew would ever take the direct route through Samaria. Instead, the pure-blooded Jews would take a more roundabout way by foot, which would take them miles out of their way. That would be similar to us wanting to go from Tacoma to Seattle by way of Spokane rather than taking the shorter, more direct route through Federal Way, all because we didn't like the people in Federal Way. That's why it's important to note in verse 4, John writes, now he, meaning Jesus, had to go through Samaria. A more literal translation would be, and it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. Now what would have compelled Jesus to break such a long established Jewish custom of avoiding the shorter route through Samaria. Why did Jesus act in a way that was so uncharacteristic of his culture? The answer is simple. Jesus had to go through Samaria because there was a spiritual need in Samaria. Jesus' response clearly shows us that our cultural differences must always be secondary to the spiritual needs of others. Following Jesus' example, our response to cultural differences should be that the needs of others must always come before our cultural preferences. This is true even if it means that we have to ignore accepted cultural norms and standards in order to meet the need. This is true not only in evangelism, but in every area of our spiritual lives. The Christian response to cultural differences prioritizes the need to give God's program the time and effort it deserves. Therefore, as Christians, we must stop letting the world instruct us about who we should be, what we should be, and with whom we should associate. When we do, we will see a marked difference in the spiritual temperature of our community and our country. That brings us to our second point, cultural differences and common ground. Entering Samaria made it clear that in Jesus' response, he was willing to go beyond his own culture. But how could Jesus overcome the prejudice of the Samaritans that he sought to reach? Common ground was the answer. Let's look at verse 6 to see what common ground could be found between a Jew and a Samaritan. Verse 6 tells us that when Jesus traveled to Samaria, he rested at Jacob's well. During his earthly ministry, Jesus, being truly human, experienced thirst, weariness, pain, 
and hunger. Jesus was often weary in his work, but never weary of his work. Thus, Jesus' reason for choosing this particular well went much deeper than that. Jesus was looking for common ground. You see, even though Jew the Jews and Samaritans hated each other, they both loved Jacob, who was the father of both groups. Therefore, Jacob was the common ground of agreement between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, who came to draw water at the well that bore that historically rich name. She may not have liked the way Jesus talked or the way Jesus dressed, but she loved Jacob, and Jesus loved Jacob too. So Jesus stopped at Jacob's well and built a bridge of communication by starting with what he and the Samaritan woman could agree on. Likewise, in determining common ground, we too have to look at what makes another person tick. When you think about it, that's not so hard to do because certain things are common to all human beings. Food, for example, is a common human need. We are currently limited by our physical gathering protocols due to COVID-19, but having a member of a different cultural background or a non-Christian over for dinner is not something that is limited to a particular experience or the knowledge of a particular culture. In fact, eating together is a symbol of fellowship in every culture that I know. The problem is that a lot of Christians never get close enough to non-Christians and members of other cultural groups to feel comfortable finding common ground. Jesus' meeting with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well enabled him to meet that woman from an alien culture at a shared point of agreement. Jesus bridged their cultural differences by establishing common ground. Moving to our next point cultural differences, and culture shock. Jesus launched into his conversation with the Samaritan woman by asking her for a drink. Now, according to verse 9, the Samaritan woman was surprised by Jesus' request because she responded, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? The Samaritan woman couldn't believe that Jesus was asking her to let him put his Jewish lips on her Samaritan cup. This was an act of fellowship and warm acceptance that caught her totally unprepared. She was in culture shock. Jesus was opening the door to a relationship with her that was not culturally acceptable. And we might pause here to ask an interesting question. How did this Samaritan woman know that Jesus was a Jew? John, the author of the gospel narrative, doesn't tell us that Jesus mentioned that he was a Jew and Jesus' disciples were in town looking for food. There was something about Jesus' manner or appearance that must have tipped her off. Perhaps his dress, his hairstyle, or even his accent. No matter what gave Jesus away, the point remains. When Jesus Christ went into Samaria, he didn't give up his own culture. Jesus didn't stop being a Jew, but he didn't let his culture stop him from meeting a spiritual need either. Granted, his request was out of the ordinary, but Jesus cared so much for her that he was willing to drink out of the same cup to reach her. You see, Jesus' response to cultural differences was that he would not let culture stand in the way of communication and ultimately the opportunity to minister. Jesus set aside his cultural tradition in favor of her spiritual needs. Let's move to our next point, cultural differences and biblical truth. Referring back to our scripture, in verses 10 through 15, Jesus tells a Samaritan woman about the living water that springs forth to eternal life. But because of her sinful nature and secular materialism, the Samaritan woman fails to understand the meaning of Jesus' words. Realizing her spiritual emptiness, Jesus then dealt with her most basic problem in verse 16. Go call your husband and come back. <coughs> Excuse me. 
excuse me. Of course, this left the woman no choice but to confess the truth, well, at least part of the truth in verse 17. I have no husband. This response provided Jesus with the open door he had waited for. Look at verses 17 and 18. You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Thus, in a few words, Jesus had revealed her life of sin and her need for salvation. But instead of confessing her sin and repenting, the Samaritan woman decided to quickly change the subject in verses 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The Samaritan woman deliberately moved away from her personal life back into the safety of her tradition. She would have little trouble dismissing Jesus' moral observations if she could engage him in a religious debate over the place of worship. Rather than addressing Jesus' moral observations about her sinful life, the Samaritan woman argues on the basis of her heritage, falling back on what had been passed down from generation to generation as truth. This, after all, was what she had been raised to believe. Jesus was more than willing to meet the Samaritan woman halfway with regard to her culture. However, compromising spiritual truth is another matter. The bottom line in the Lord's response and our response is this. When culture comes into conflict with what God has said in his word, culture is wrong and must be rejected. What my parents taught me is only valuable to the degree that it conforms to divine truth. If I was taught to dislike people on the basis of racial or cultural differences, my response to cultural differences must reject that teaching. Jesus told the Samaritan woman that her culturally based position was without foundation. This has application for us as well. Jesus' answer to the woman and to us is found in verse 23. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshiper the Father seek. In other words, Jesus is saying, the hour is coming when I'm going to pull together a group of people who are not going to be interested in cultural differences. Jesus was referring to the church age, a time when it wouldn't matter where you worshiped. What counted was that you worshiped in spirit and in truth. God's response is that he does not look at the cultural barriers that separate people. He looks at their hearts. God's criteria are spirit and truth, not location and culture. You see, True worshipers are those who realize that Jesus is the truth of God and the one and only way to the Father. God is truth, and to worship in truth is to worship God through Jesus. God is spirit, and to worship in spirit is to worship in the new spiritual realm where God rules and we share in his eternal life. The Father is seeking true worshipers because he wants people to live in reality and not in falsehood. Therefore, the place to be, whether pastor or layperson, is in a fellowship of believers that welcomes all people who want to worship God regardless of culture. If people to prefer to attend services that reflect their own culture, that's fine. But if people are unwelcome in a fellowship that is populated by people of different cultures, that is unacceptable. Why? Because God is interested in truth. Once we know what the truth is, in this case, that God has broken down the barriers that separate us, then we must live by that truth in order to please God. And that brings us to our next point, cultural differences and Christian identity. <clears throat> As Christians, 
knowing that God has broken down the barriers that separate us, the implications for our Christian response to cultural differences become much clearer. As one pastor points out, to refer to oneself as an African-American Christian or a white Christian or an Asian Christian or a Hispanic Christian is technically incorrect. In these descriptions, the word Christian becomes a noun, which is modified by an adjective, African-American, white, Asian, Hispanic, and so on. Our Christianity should never be modified by our culture. In fact, the opposite should be true. Our culture must be modified by the nature of our Christian commitment. We must see ourselves as Christian African-Americans, Christian whites, Christian Asians, Christian Hispanics, and so on. In other words, our culture must always be controlled by our commitment to Christ. Thus, black is only beautiful if it is biblical, and white is only right when it conforms to the Holy Scriptures. Whenever we make the adjectives white, black, and brown descriptive of Christians, it means we have changed Christianity to make it culturally convenient. But the Bible teaches us that we are all Christians who happen to belong to various cultural groups. In our response to cultural differences, if anything changes, it is to be our cultural orientation, not our Christianity. Our faith must always inform, explain, and change our culture, never the reverse. It's a question of embracing our Christian identity. Let's move to our final point, cultural differences and cross-cultural ministry. What we desperately need today is a group of Christians of all cultures who, without negating their own heritage, are committed to the scriptures, people who have dedicated themselves to making Christianity descriptive of who they are. This opens the door for every believer to evangelize every non-believer because cultural barriers are no longer an issue. The truth of God's word commands us to reach out to the lost. Let's return to our scripture, verses 28 and 30, to see the full impact of Jesus' bold detour through Samaria. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. By the Spirit, the Samaritan woman acknowledged the truth of Christ's messiahship and of his all-knowing character and immediately became a powerful witness for her remarkable discovery. To summarize and close, no pure-blooded Jew would dare take step in Samaria, but Jesus did. The woman in today's scripture lesson was a Samaritan, a member of a hated mixed race. She was known to be living in sin, and she was in a public place alone because even the other women in the village wouldn't draw water from the well with her. No respectable Jewish man would talk to a woman under those circumstances, but Jesus did. Being equipped for the new year to be a better person and to be more spiritual means that our Christian response to cultural differences means that the gospel is for every person, no matter what their race, social position, religious orientation, or past sins. We must be prepared to share the good news of the gospel at any time and in any place. Jesus crossed all barriers to share the gospel, and we who follow him must do no less. If we want to truly understand and experience God's love ourselves, then our Christian response to cultural differences must be that we must be willing to welcome all those whom God loves into our worshiping community. Like Jesus and Dr. King, we must stop allowing culture to stand in the way of spiritual truth, spiritual needs, and spiritual outreach so that the body of Christ, of Christ can grow and the testimony of the gospel can be established. In this new year, 
if you and I make the commitment to touch those around us, demonstrating the truth, meeting the needs, and making the outreach as Jesus did in Samaria, many will come to know Christ because they will have seen his presence in our lives. The Capitol insurrection, political turmoil, horrific pandemic, and other combined crises of our day constitute an historic opportunity to show our broken culture the difference Jesus makes in those who love and follow him fully. The darker the room, the more powerful the light. If we truly love our Lord, we will love our neighbors as ourselves. We will love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. We will help those in need as if they were Jesus. We will pray earnestly for God to send out laborers into his harvest, then serve in answer to our prayers. The more we love Jesus, the more we will live by the truth of his word and share his word with the world. Amen. After her encounter with Christ at Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman said, Come see a man who knows everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Jesus sees all and knows all. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. Jesus is ready to accept you with open arms. If you have not yet accepted Jesus as your Savior, why don't you take advantage of that opportunity right now. Just say, Jesus, I am a sinner. I want to confess my sins and repent. I believe that you are the Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, and he will open your heart to you. If you have taken that step this morning, reach out to us at the number on your screen, and we will reach out to you. May you be blessed in this momentous decision as you begin this wonderful journey in your new relationship with Jesus Christ. In God's service, may you find fulfillment. In God's pardon, may you find peace. In God's presence, may you find power. Stay healthy, stay safe, amen. Hello, I am Anise Marshall, and I want to thank you for joining us in today's services in honoring and remembering the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A special thanks to Reverend Edwards and all the youth and other participants. As a member of the health ministry, we want to update you on where we are within the governor's plans for moving through his COVID protocol. We appreciate Governor Inslee's recent announcement that we have graduated to phase two and that our state will be working hard to get the vaccines out to the, out to the community within the next months. For more information, you can check with your provider or watch this, this stream until the end and get a pen to write down the COVID resource information numbers. Special thanks to God's Groceries volunteer team in all ministries that help make us make our day a success on this past third Friday. We distributed the food that our partners at the American Baptist Foundation and our partner, Pastor Heyman, from the New Walk Christian Church, where we give out PPP outreach for the people with passion and purpose from noon until 2 p.m. We offer communities in the great, greater Seattle food, prayer, and resources. On the third Friday, God's Grocery combines the free food partner giveaway with our corporate catering partners, Demetrius Jazz Alley Entrees, which are given out every Tuesday and Friday, noon until 1.30 p.m. Thank you to all ministries who have handed in their annual reports so that we can update the congregation on your 2020 ministry work. All of this information will be included in the annual church meeting. Tonight, it is Unity Call Prayer Night. We invite all ministry leaders and church family to join us for the third Sunday Unity Call at 5 p.m. The number to use tonight is the same that we use Monday through Saturday on our prayer line. 
The number is 425-436-6306. And the passcode is 147230-POUND. I repeat, the number is the same that we use Monday through Saturday, and you want to use it especially tonight, which you can see the number on the screen. Additional, additional announcements include that the AB girls will be having their regular virtual meeting on Sunday, January 17th at 5 p.m. Also, we would like to announce that there will be the annual church meeting, which will be held Friday, January 22nd at 6 p.m. Additionally, there will be a special called meeting on Friday, January 29th at 6 p.m. Thank you for sharing our services today here at Mount Zion Baptist Church. Please continue to watch as we go through more of the health ministry resource list and that will help keep you and your family informed. Thank you. to keep